1 Corinthians 12 is where we'll be landing, for those of you who didn't hear. Um, Yes, and thank you again, worship team. Uh, Have you ever stopped to marvel at the miracle of the human body? The human body, it, it, uh, it produces 25 million new cells a second to replenish the total of tens of trillions of cells that make up the whole body, which collectively hold enough DNA in them to stretch from the earth to the sun and back dozens of times, a few dozen times. Our hearts beat about 100,000 times a day. Our blood vessels could stretch around the globe at the equator multiple times if put end to end. We have more than 600 individual muscles and over 200 individual bones. Those bones are stronger than steel and yet... We are 60% made up of water. (laughs) Information travels from our brain to different parts of our body and back at nearly 250 miles an hour. And all of this is to say nothing of the complex system of hormones that contributes to our emotions or or the the, the relative mysteries of sleep and the greater mystery of dreams. What we know of the human body flirts with the seemingly impossible, and yet there's still much we don't know and more that we do not fully understand about it. The human body is incredible, and it's capable of incredible things. And those incredible feats of the body are largely due to the seamless integration of its many diverse parts. We can throw and catch because our brain coordinates our hands with our eyes. And walking seems simple until you consider that it's only possible because our brains coordinate our toes, our feet, our ankles, our knees, our hips, our arms, our backs, and our eyes all simultaneously. You come to appreciate the complexity and difficulty of such simple tasks when you watch a relatively new human being, say, learn how to walk for the first time, if it's going to play. Oh, the video doesn't work. It was really cute. You should be disappointed. (laughs) You also gain an appreciation, though, for the complexity of those simple acts when one or more of the requisite body parts are not working properly or you don't have the requisite body parts or your brain has lost the ability to coordinate the actions. I remember pulling my calf muscle in my basketball playing middle school days and I had to, I had to alter my shot completely because of one part that wasn't working properly. I could no longer put my weight on my right leg, so I had to shift it to my left leg, and that meant that I had to change the trajectory of my arm as it took its shot. In in short, my entire body had to compensate because one part wasn't functioning properly. And that is because every part of the body... Every part of the body affects every other part of the body. It's all integrated. The body is an incredible integrated system. And it is perhaps the dominant picture of the composition of the church. Let me pray for us, and then I'd like us to consider that picture together. Father, we, we really worship you as creator this morning as we consider the body of Christ that you have composed. So I praise you for your wisdom and your creativity and the beauty that you, um, that you have woven into your people and this picture of us as the body of Christ. And so... I pray that as we look at at what it means that the church is 
the body of Christ, that we would be drawn to worship you this morning. That we would be um, awed by its beauty, humbled by our role within it. So I pray that you would be here and lead this morning by your spirit, that me, we may glorify you as we look at your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So two weeks ago, Stan began our series on the church, looking at the identity of the church. And he said that the church's identity comes from its relationship to Jesus. And that relationship allows it to be the, the expression of Christ on earth today. And then today we're going to consider the composition of the church and just let me begin by prefacing this and saying we are not going to cover everything that goes into the composition of the church. There's a lot. That's a huge topic. Lord willing, more of it will be covered as we go through our series. But today is really just about the basic composition of the church. And Stan's exposition of uh, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 last week really began to address this topic. Verse 23 tells us that the church is, quote, his, that is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, this is a statement about the universal church made up of all who trust in Christ for their salvation. The New Testament speaks of church really in two senses, and this is the first. The Greek word ekklesia, Ecclesia was used broadly in the first century to designate any gathering that had a specific purpose. And in its sort of broader or secular usage in the first century, usually that meant a political purpose of some kind. For instance, in Acts 19, the assembly that Demetrius the silversmith brings together at the theater in Ephesus to try the companions of Paul, that was re- that's ecclesia there. One of the few instances in the New Testament where it's not referring to, to the church in some sense. But it's an ecclesia that, that Demetrius gathers to try to try. These, these saints. And so that was kind of its usage in the first century. But the New Testament, and Paul in particular, repurposes this word to mean really to, to refer to two things primarily. Refer, one, to the spiritual gathering of all who are in Christ, so the universal church, and then two, the regular gathering of professing believers in a particular place, that is the local church. We've already seen the universal, uh, the universal um, sense of this in Ephesians 1.23, and it comes up again throughout Ephesians. Later on in chapter 5, in his instructions to husbands in verse 25, Paul qualifies the church as those for whom Christ gave himself, for whom Christ died, okay? And that's why, in the words of Ephesians 4.4, which we read earlier, there is one body, There's one body. There's one body made up of simply those who have been saved through Christ. The universal church is sometimes referred to as the invisible or the spiritual church because it emphasizes the spiritual reality that all who are united to Christ are also united to one another in Christ. Okay, Those who are united to Christ are united to one another in Christ. And so it's the invisible or the spiritual church. So we have the body, and this is the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head and which constitutes his fullness. But this is a massive group of people, obviously. So how is this massive group of people held together and organized? And the short answer is through the local church. That's, that's the short answer, through the local church. But I want to make a few important distinctions before we we move on to to look at that. Because at the local church level, we will sometimes talk about things like members and membership and becoming a member, things like that. And so I want to be clear about who is a member of the church and how you gain access to that membership in the church. You are a member of the church of Jesus— if you trust in Jesus for your salvation. Okay, you are a member of the church of Jesus if you trust in Jesus for your salvation. And you gain that membership by grace through faith 
in Jesus, period. That's it, okay? You're a member of the church of Christ if you trust in him for your salvation. You gain access to that membership by grace through faith in Jesus. Okay, so becoming a member of Emmanuel Bible Church doesn't affect your membership in the church at all, one way or the other. Similarly, meeting with the EBC elders to talk about membership and become a member does not gain you access to the church, even if it does gain you access to additional opportunities to serve in the local church here at EBC. Okay, so that's, that's said, though, that, that your, your membership in the church is just about being saved by Jesus. That said, one of the primary marks of a member of the church is involvement in a local church. One of the marks of a member of the church is involvement in and connection to a local church or the local church. The necessity of being connected to the church in a physical place can be seen in multiple ways. First, the Bible simply calls for it, right? Ephesians 10, or sorry, not Ephesians, we're, we're in, I'm in Ephesians a lot, but Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to neglect the gathering of the saints for the purpose of stirring one another up to love and good works. So the Bible just calls for it. And again, going back to the word used for church throughout the the New Testament, ecclesia, its primary meaning is that of a physical gathering in a place for a purpose. That purpose in New Testament context being to worship God and, and the building up of the body and the continuing of the mission of Christ. I also think the picture of the church as the body of Christ, one of the primary things that's supposed to communicate is physical presence. This was, this was part of Stan's point a couple of weeks ago that the identity of the church is to represent Christ on earth, is the physical expression of Christ's presence on earth. And I think the picture of us as the body of Christ is meant to capture that component of physical embodiment of Christ's presence on earth, which necessitates physical gathering. And then I actually think the call of Christ to disciple the nations actually implies physically getting together because it's really hard to do discipleship to, to its fullest extent without getting together. If you never see somebody, it's really hard to disciple them or to be discipled by them. And then there's just the simple fact that there are no examples in the New Testament, no, at least no positive examples. There's John on the island of Patmos, but, you know, that's, that's an exception, I would say. Uh, that there's no good examples of a lone Christian in the New Testament. It just doesn't happen. It's just not there. This is going to be expounded further in coming weeks, but a member of the church, saved by grace, baptized into the body, is marked by the act of gathering with other saints for regular worship, teaching, fellowship, discipleship, and the continuing mission of making, discipling, baptizing, teaching more disciples, all to the glory of God. A member of the church is marked by the act of gathering with other members of the church. And while this marker is in part simply obedience to the command of Christ, like like the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, it's also simply a necessity born out of the reality that we are parts of the body. And body parts that are separated from the body don't do well. They can't survive, actually. Okay, so it's partly obedience to Christ, but it's partly just because, you know, we're a hand or we're a foot and we don't do well when we don't have a body, right? We are each a part of the body insofar as we are in Christ, saved through him, but that shows itself concretely in being a part of the local gathering of saints. And I would argue that each local church, each local gathering, is a part of the larger body of Christ and a body unto itself. And I say this for a couple of of reasons. First, and this is why 
Local, body, local churches are a part of the larger body of Christ. No local church, I guess I should say should, uh, maybe some would, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm hoping no local church would ever claim to be, quote, the fullness of him who fills all in all, right? Like, the EBC website is never going to have that as like our, our slogan, you know, it's never going to be Emmanuel Bible Church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Like, that's never going to be how we qualify our, our local church. And so in that sense, we are a part of the larger body of Christ. And yet, then we have verses like 1 Corinthians 12, 27, where Paul says to a local gathering of believers, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of of it. And so local churches are a part of the body of Christ at the same time they are a body in their own right. In my mind, it's a bit of a, a Russian nesting doll situation, if you've ever seen these. Um, yeah, there they are. Uh, it's like we have the fullness of Christ who fills all in all, and, and that's that's constituted or expressed in the, in the universal church, which is composed of local churches, which are composed of individual saints, all of whom, by the way, bear the image of Christ, right? And so there's this, there's this sort of, again, Russian nesting doll sort of image of Christ thing going on with individual saints up to the universal church. And 1 Corinthians 12 is all about how individual saints are composed within the local body. Let's open to that chapter if you're not already there and consider what Paul says, beginning with verses 12 through 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So the focus of these verses is the many that make up the one. The many that make up the one. There is one body empowered by one spirit, and yet that body is composed of many parts. One body, many parts. Just as human bodies have many parts, so too the body of Christ is made up of many parts and yet is a single entity, a single body. An important note here is what defines the defining identity of the members of this one body. We know from the rest of the letter to the Corinthians that the, the church at Corinth was, was a diverse church. And this likely played a role in, in the, the note that Paul has here on, uh, about Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. He makes it clear that membership in the body is not on the basis of culture or ethnicity or socioeconomic status but is solely based on participation in the one spirit that gives life to the one body. That's what, that's what means you're a part of the body. If you show, if you have the spirit that shows you as a part or a member of the body. And it's clear from other passages that the Corinthians struggled with falling into their culture's value system that valued people one more or less based on things like their ethnicity or socioeconomic identity. But Paul is going to go on to address two, two problematic attitudes based on such value systems and makes it clear that there's no place for such value systems in the church. There's no place for such value systems in the church. And it is this sort of singular identity of those filled with the spirit that marks people as, 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 as a member of the church that actually ends up resulting in the diversity of that passage that we, we read it from, from Revelation during the worship where all tribes, all tongues, all nations, all ethnicities, everybody is represented in the people of God at the end. It becomes incredibly, incredibly diverse because it's, it's just a matter of if you have the Spirit or not. 
Okay, so Paul's going to go on to address these problematic attitudes, and he addresses the first one in verses 14 through 20. 14 through 20. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and yet one body. So the first attitude that Paul addresses here is, is actually the attitude of self-deprecation. Self-deprecation, undervaluing your role in the body. Both of these problematic attitudes are going to come from a tendency that, that cultures have. It's a tendency of culture to emphasize certain roles and skills and virtues and things like that while minimizing other ones. It happens, it happens all over the place. And the different emphases change culture to culture and era to era. And they aren't necessarily based on any intrinsic superior goodness in the things that are emphasized. Um, not, which is not to say that they're not good things that are being emphasized, just that they're not necessarily superior to others. Uh, look, I, I love sports. I love sports. But you don't have to look any further than our culture's obsession with athletes and sport teams and things like that to see this relatively arbitrary elevation of certain skills and gifts. Again, good skills and gifts, but, but we, we elevate them beyond others, right? A great example from our current church culture is the emphasis that we have, we've placed on dynamic preachers. We've placed an emphasis on dynamic preaching, which don't, don't hear me wrong here. Preaching is good and essential and even uniquely foundational to the life of the church. I, should be fairly obvious, I would say, that I'm a fan of it. Like, I like preaching. Um, but it's no more essential than, say, prayer. Prayer is just as essential to the life of the church. And yet, how many famous prayer warriors could you name right now? Versus how many famous preachers can you name? Again, I'm not sure such emphases are necessarily bad, but they do carry with them the potential for, for someone to think, man, I'm just, like, I'm just not cut out for like, this biblical interpretation stuff. I must not be a very important part of the body, or I must not be a necessary part of the body. Such emphases carry the potential that someone might think something like that. And if that's you, if you've ever felt this way, then I've got great news for you. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to be essential to the life of the church. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to be essential to the life of the church. Now, you should read your Bible, okay? You should read your Bible and prayerfully seek to understand it and apply it to the best of your ability. That's a must. The Word of God is a must in the life of every believer. But it's okay if you don't know what the word hermeneutics means. That's all right. That's okay. Or if you kind of like, you know that context is important because you've heard like preachers like me say context is really important, but you're not exactly sure like how it's important or why it's important. You've just heard it a lot. That's okay. That's all right. You have Bible nerds like me or like Stan or like Grant Clay or, or others to, to help you in that area. It's okay if that's not you. But you have a role in the body of Christ. Everyone hear me. You have a role in the body of Christ. And whatever it is, it is necessary. It is essential to the life of the body. Even if it seems like your gift or role doesn't fit in, I guarantee you it does. <laughs> 
It might just take some work to figure out how it fits in. And if that's you, I or, or, the, or the pastors or the elders, we would love to help you with that process of figuring that out. But Paul's point here is that the, the, the diversity of the body is a good thing. Actually, his point is that it's a necessary thing. The diversity of the body is a good and necessary thing. Let's move on to verses 21 through 26. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So this is simply the flip side of the first problematic attitude that we saw. The first was that no part of the body is expendable, no matter how insignificant it seems. And then the flip side is that no part of the body is self-sufficient, no matter how significant it seems. Unfortunately, our current church landscape is full of examples of people who mistakenly thought they were more essential to the life and the ministry of the church than others. And you know what happens to the body? Do you know what happens to churches when somebody takes on that attitude? It dies. <laughs> the body dies. Churches die. And that's what we've seen happen. We've seen churches dissolve. And we've seen detriment to the ministry of the church as a whole. In the body of Christ, the members are equally essential. Okay, and that's important wording, but the, 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 the members are equally essential because we all have the same spirit in us empowering the unique gifts and roles that we have. And he has so composed the church that every part needs every other part. God, in fact, has honored those who have less honor in the world and I, and I think maybe humbled those who have maybe more honor according to the world's standards so that we might be united and care for one another. United and care for one another. According to these verses, if you don't suffer when your brother suffers, whoever that brother is, if you don't rejoice when your sister is honored, whoever that sister is, then there may be something wrong with how you're relating to the body. There may be something wrong with how you're relating to the church because you need your brothers and sisters and you are tied to them if you're a part of the body. Let's wrap up our exposition by looking at verses 27 through 31. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So Paul begins the conclusion of his discussion of the gifts and roles within the church by summarizing his, his main point once again, just to make sure the Corinthians don't miss it. The Corinthians, he says, you, you are an expression of the one body of Christ, the one unified body of Christ, and each individual diverse saint plays an essential role in that body. No gift or role can stand alone, nor can any gift or role be excluded. And they all evidence the filling of the Holy Spirit, which alone marks each member of the body. Okay? The body is composed of the many made one. 
Many made one. Many different roles, one entity. And as Trinitarians, that should, that should sound like really familiar language, right? The many being made one. And I think it ought to make us think of, of passages like John 17. But Paul then moves on to a list of roles and gifts. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healing, helping, administrating, and tongues. Now, we're not going to take a deep dive into these, these gifts this morning, but I do want to make a few notes. And the first is that although each role and gift is essential to the body, that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't some that are, say, more foundational than others, or more noticeable at least. Paul seems to set apart apostles, prophets, and teachers as uniquely foundational to the establishment and and maintenance of the church here, while still implying the necessity and value of less foundational gifts. And look, I get that, that that can kind of give us a bad taste in our mouths. Like it sounds like God's playing favorites here. I, I understand that. But then there's, this is just the simple reality that this is how God has composed the body. This is how God has composed and organized the body. It's also why in 1 Corinthians thirteen four, just a few verses after this, right, Love is said to not envy or boast. To not envy or boast. Because there, there are, the reality is, there are some gifts that are more noticeable, that seem more prominent or more significant and things like that. That's, a, that's just a reality. And that's why we're called not to envy somebody's gift who seems like they've got a more prominent gift than ours. And we're not to boast over someone who seems like they have a less significant gift. We are all called to exercise our gifts and roles in humility and love for the purpose of building up the body of Christ as a whole. That's the end goal. Regardless of the gift or the role and how prominent it may seem, the goal is to exercise it with love and humility for the building up of the body as a whole. So all gifts and roles are essential, even if some are more foundational or noticeable. And Paul says, with the right motivation, it's actually a good thing to seek to pursue these higher gifts, these higher gifts. But the motivation is essential. The motivation is essential because plenty in the church at Corinth sought these higher gifts for their own notoriety or, or, or their own pride. And it's clear from the letter that this did damage within their, their gatherings as a church. However, it's also natural that one who loves God and loves their brothers and sisters and, and loves the world to want to have the greatest impact for the, for the glory of God and the good of the church and the salvation of the world. And therefore, it's, it's natural to desire these, these higher gifts that Paul talks about here. But again, the motivation is of utmost importance, which is why Paul lands on the most excellent gift and the most excellent role within the body of Christ. And it's a gift and a role that is available to everyone, to every part of the body. And it is the more excellent way of love, the more excellent way of love. And Paul goes on to spend an entire chapter talking about this way of love. Love is the most important thing that we do as Christians. Love is what holds together the many as the one body of Christ. And it's also the thing that draws other people into the body of Christ. And so in closing, I want to reflect once more on the picture of the church as the body and think about why love and humility are so vitally important Have you ever considered how, just how different some of the body parts are? For instance, what in the world do a hand and an eye have in common? What do they have in common? They have different functions. They're made of different tissue. They're different shapes. They have, uh, they're they're in different parts. They're in different locations of the body. 
In short, there is nothing, that I can think of at least, there is, n- there is nothing that a hand and an eye have in common except the fact they are a part of the same body. That's the only thing. Similarly, different parts of the body often struggle to get along. My nose, for instance, often struggles to appreciate my feet because my feet are very often repulsive (laughs) to my nose, which is not a result of my feet doing something wrong or my nose doing something wrong. In fact, the better better job those two parts are doing, right, the better they're carrying out their God-given roles in my body, (laughs) the more repulsive my feet are to my nose. I get that that's funny. And maybe you think I'm taking this metaphor too far, but I would submit to you that this is the basic point that Paul is trying to get at as he writes to a local church whose members are struggling to get along with one another and to appreciate and consider one another and to love one another. We Christians, we do a fair amount of critiquing, member to member, church to church, denomination to denomination, and so on some of which is right and good and necessary, right? Calling out legitimate false teaching needs to happen. Calling out unloving practices needs to happen. Calling out attitudes that do not reflect the character of Christ needs to happen. But I'm personally suspicious that more of our critiques than we realize or care to admit come down to the simple reality that we are just different parts of the body. And that means that we are bound to be different from one another in significant ways. Think about this, for instance. Our church service this morning, I guarantee you, looks very different from the church service Pastor Stan was in today. It was like 11 hours ago, but right? He had a very different church service today. It looked different. The style of worship, I guarantee you, was different. I guess if he was preaching, the preaching was pretty much the same, but very different, right? And his church service and our church service, very different from a church service in Europe, right? Or in Japan, or in South America. Very, very different. So as we carry out the necessary and loving act of gently correcting and admonishing one another, let us make sure we're doing it with humility and love. With humility and love. Love that seeks, that truly seeks, not just lip service, not just says it's seeking this, but truly seeks the good of our brother Christian or our sister church or our cousin denomination that fills a different but equally essential role in the larger body of Christ. And humility that understands that we need the one who is different from us just as much as they need us. Right? Stan is not in Africa right now because our brothers and sisters in Africa have all kinds of needs but nothing to give to us. Right? Stan is in Africa for mutual encouragement. He's he's absolutely there to share something that he has, but he's also there to receive what they have for us. And they have much for us. I'm struck by the fact, as Stan was getting ready to leave, I was struck by the fact that every time he comes back to Africa, the first time he he preaches and he, he mentions his trip, you notice how they have always sent us greetings. Our brothers and sisters in Africa never fail to tell Stan to communicate their greetings to us. And yet, I always forget. (laughs) I forget to send that message back to them, to my shame. They have much to teach us, even if we have something to give them. For God has so composed the body of Christ that it is through the many being united as one in, in love and humility that the church realizes her identity as the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
God has so composed the body of Christ that it is through the many being united as one in love and humility that the church realizes her identity as the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so, in the words of Colossians 3.14, which we read earlier, and above all these things, put on love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. And may it be with us, some of the many who are called in Christ, baptized in one spirit, into one body, all to display the manifold wisdom and glory of the Father. May it be with us. Let's pray.